Coming in, in these challenging times, Town Hall is grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we don't get to do it, you know, in person. Town Hall will continue to produce virtual content throughout this, this fall and into the new year, and the circumstances allow to even host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if Zoom or YouTube fatigue hasn't fully set in, you should know that many of our past talks were available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. But back to tonight. Tonight's uh, the program will likely run about 50 minutes in total. At approximately the 30 minute mark, David plans to introduce us directly via phone to Jarvis J. Masters, whose story is at the center of tonight's discussion. It's an extraordinary opportunity, after which we'll have time for an audience Q&A. You can view the event on Crowdcast or our YouTube page. To participate in the Q&A, submit directly using the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the page on Crowdcast. We'll get to as many as possible. For closed captioning, YouTube is your best bet, and you can enable real-time captions by clicking the CC button in the bottom right-hand corner of that screen. Meanwhile, Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include B.J. Cummings, James Rasmussen, and Paulina oh, Lopez on the untold regional impact of the Duwamish River, Jonathan Slate on the quest to find and save the world's largest owl, as well as upcoming events with George Dyson, Michael Ian Black, Rick Perlstein, impeachment manager and California representative Eric Swalwell in conversation with Washington representative Denny Heck, and a future file that includes Cass Sunstein, Aaron Brockovich, Jill Lepore, Senators Sherrod Brown and, and Chris Murphy, and Alex Ross in conversation with Ann Powers. Plenty more about most of the above at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Arts and culture programming in particular is uh, supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But fundamentally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching tonight's program. As you might imagine, this is a time of great challenge for nonprofits. Town Hall alone has cut its budget by over a third this year in an effort to navigate well, the coming season. And so we're truly grateful to you for purchasing a ticket to tonight's program. If you support Town Hall's mission to keep programs accessible to the whole community, we hope you will consider further support with a membership or by making a donation through the button at the bottom of your screen. Newsflash, this is not an easy time for booksellers either. And since we know you will want to learn more about tonight's topic after the talk, Here's a way to proverbially at least kill two birds. Buy a copy of the book tonight through our local independent partners at LA Bay Book Company using the link on this very page, rather than perhaps later on through some stateless multinational conglomerate. All right. <laughs> Journalist, it's not, <laughs> take a while. <laughs> Journalist David has written for the New York Times, Rolling Stone, Wired, Fortune, and for National Public Radio's All Things Considered, among other publications. One of those articles in the New York Times Magazine was called My Addicted Son and inspired his 2009 book, Beautiful Boy, which changed the trajectory of his work for years to come. Named the best nonfiction book of the year by Entertainment Weekly, this unflinching and personal account received the first ever American Academy of Addiction, Psychiatry, Arts and Literature Award, among numerous other medical and literary distinct distinctions. And it led to Chef's inclusion in 2009's Time Magazine, Time 100. His subsequent books include Clean, Overcoming Addiction and Ending America's Greatest Tragedy from 2013, and 2019's High, Everything You Want to Know About Drugs, Alcohol, and Addiction, written with his son, Nick. Ari Cohn is the executive director of the Post-Prison Education Program. Founded in 2005, the Post-Prison Education Program is the only program in Washington State offering wraparound services to released prisoners and their families in conjunction with providing access, support, and resources to attain a post-secondary education. The program works within prisons and in partnership with a statewide network of community and governmental organizations to find students, provide scholarships, and community mentorship while they earn their degrees. David Sheff's book, The Buddhist on Death Row, How One Man Found Light in the Darkest Place, is the subject of their talk together tonight. Please join me in welcoming Ari Cohn and David Sheff. Thank you, Weir. Thank you. Hello again, David. Um, I, David, when I, I had read uh, Beautiful Boy, and I knew the story with Nick, and I, when I was reading Buddhist on Death Row, I wondered if you would have gotten out to San Quentin to Jarvis if you hadn't had the experience with the 10-year the battle with meth and, 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 and Nick getting caught up in that, your whole family getting caught up in it. Cause I, what, you know, what our experience has been that people 
have to have sort of been there, done that. They have to have had some loved one in their family that suffered mental illness, ended up in prison, addiction, ended up in prison, addiction and mental illness, ended up in prison, abject poverty, ended up in prison. Um, you know, one of our first large donors, uh, way back 2006 or so, a woman named Debbie LeMay, uh, we were at her house hoping for a $8,000 check and she wrote 40, which back in that's now like three weeks money. But back then it was a big deal. And, and we later learned that she and her husband were both addicted and they had, they had actually, before she inherited, she, you know, so she'd been there, done that. And with Doris Buffett, even Warren's sister, um, Doris's mom was, was bipolar. And, and, and Warren never was abused, but Doris was. So when Doris inherited, uh, she, she started her philanthropic efforts. So I just, I just was thinking that maybe you would have never made it out to San Quentin. And so I would like you to talk about that if you can, uh, how, how the one experience might've led to the other or, or maybe not. It's really an interesting thought and it's making me think about the time. Uh, it actually, is very very intertwined um and you're right that there are so many connections between uh you know the world that we fell into without any intention when my son did become addicted and we spent you know 10 years in the trying to navigate the treatment system and nick was arrested and he um you know we know many people who uh became you know addicted who are in prison and and um it's uh, so there's there's that connection, but the other piece of it I think is, um, is when you go through something like we went through, you know, every family has their own version of it. I hear from people all the time. You know, they they might read my book and they'll say, "Oh right," and they'll say, "You know, your story is our story, your family is my family," but we have different, uh, you know, different details. And and sometimes it's drugs and addiction, and sometimes it might be mental illnesses, as you suggest. Um, Sometimes it's a it's a incarcerated loved one, and the thing that I guess we all have in common is, um, you know, it brings it right back again to this idea. You know, the the the, the, uh, the Buddhist on death row, the way a Buddhist survives on death row, is um, that, that's um, I'm gonna get that because that's Jarvis calling. So give me one oh, second. Oh, oh. I'm gonna say is that it's all about suffering, and it's so you you know you're you're absolutely right. There's a real connection there. Okay, tell me. I have a call from Jarvis. An inmate at the California State Prison, Sorry, can you hear that? California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded to accept it. Wait, wait, something's happening. Uh, hello? Well, this is a glimpse of <laughs> what it's like to live on death row. Uh, you are at the mercy of, uh, well, you're, you're at the mercy of the state of California, basically, and including you know, the ability to make phone calls. In fact, um, it was only up until recently, um, Jarvis would not have been able to call in. I, I'm sure he'll call right back. But um, up until recently, Jarvis would not have been able to call in because uh, of the COVID uh, epidemic just you know swept through San Quentin, and uh, so they deprived. You know, one of the things they did was shut down telephones because the phones are all shared, which makes a lot of sense, of course, in terms of transmitting the disease. But on the other hand, the way Jarvis talked about it was, it just made it scarier for the men in prison, for their families. They couldn't connect with one another. They couldn't check in. You know, how are you doing? Are you okay? Because we were reading every day in the newspaper about what was going on in San Quentin which was a nightmare. You know, they went from having zero cases to three weeks later because of the uh, state prison, uh, the uh, corrective Department of Corrections brought about 100 prisoners from a, another institution where there were many COVID cases to San Quentin where there were none. And within weeks, San Quentin had 2,000 cases uh, out of 3,500 men. So it was devastating. And, and uh, Jarvis got very sick. You know, maybe he could talk about it a little bit what it was like it to be in there um yeah i want to ask him to talk to tell us about it because COVID 19 is a huge issue up here and 
you know, like you and I discussed earlier, we uh, Taylor Buck in, in our office and I had had a WebEx with a woman who volunteers in San Quentin, Angela, uh, just a couple months ago, and there were no no COVID cases in San Quentin, and then all of a sudden, there, like you just said, there was two thousand and what twenty five died, right? Yeah, twenty five died. In fact, yeah. yeah, Jarvis will tell you. I mean, it's been heartbreaking for him because he's known some of those guys uh, for you know forty years almost, and and um, you know they've been friends. The guy in his next cell uh, died, and he said that um, he heard the coughing, he heard the wheezing, he heard the breathing. Uh, Finally, they took the guy away, and um, it was just a cell left with the TV on. I mean, they left the TV on, and he said, it's a "Haunting feeling." And you know, San Quentin is set up. It's like an uh, it's old fast. New, new prisons are much more sort of uh, you know, it's all automatic, and the walls are all electronically and it's steel. San Quentin is an old fashioned prison, like in the movies, with the open bars and these big, big tiers. I think they're in the in the cell block that Jarvis lives in. There are five or six tiers. Each tier has about 50 cells on it, uh, and they're across from each other. So you can imagine how, you know, one sneeze uh, out of the cell into a place where there are 500 men contained in this one blunt building, uh, no protection. Uh, so it's just, you know, right for this kind of a disaster, and it, it's really been uh, tragic. Can you, until he dials back in, can you go back and talk more about your journey from, from, beautiful boy and 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 nick's addiction to to san quinn i because i think i just think that's compelling and i think it's super interesting and and it's um it's just been our experience for 15 years that the people who don't experience this and don't have a touch in their personal lives they're just not involved or they're what we call haters and 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 i and uh so I, I I was I just really uh, it's uh, there's an umbilical cord between your two books, uh, not to mention the decade. I mean, I think you're, uh, it's really an interesting thing to point out, and it really is true. Uh, and a lot of it is about the connection to, you know, when I when Nick when my son became addicted, I I um, you know went into the spiral and it lasted for ten years. And when you go through something like a child's addiction or a, any other crisis in your life, you really started to you, it changes you forever. And it makes you aware of different kinds of things. And, um, you know, I've been working before that. I was working on a business book. And suddenly that business book lost all interest to me. It was not what I needed to focus on. Um, and I learned more about addiction. I learned what it was like to have somebody who's addicted in your family. I learned about the prejudice. I learned about the stigma. I learned about the shame, the way that I was even ashamed. You know, if my son had another disease, I would have been open about it and talking about it and my friends and family and neighbors would have been helping and bringing over casseroles, but because of the shame that's related to addiction, um, that didn't happen. And I think it's very, very similar for people who are incarcerated. There is this shame that people who are behind bars all of a sudden stop being considered human beings. And so I would go into these treatment programs and I'd be sitting with these other guys and a lot of them had, and, and some women as well. And a lot of them had been in and out of prisons because of their drug use or crimes that they had committed while they were on drugs. And uh, their lives were in this you know, downward spiral. And instead of offering the support and help that they needed and the help that they deserved that would ultimately allow them to be better, to get better and to have productive and, and lives that were filled with you know, joy and, and, and um, satisfying relationships, uh, they were stigmatized even more and they had fewer opportunities and fewer opportunities. And so it's no surprise that so many of them turned to prison over and over again and returned to drugs over and over again. So, um, you know, this idea though, I guess in, in being a writer and deciding to go forward and to tell the story of our family, um, it is a way of uh, working through issues, working through, it's, it's sort of cathartic in some ways to write like that. And it also, I realized, is a way to connect with other people when we share our stories. So the idea of sharing the story of someone who's in death row on San Quentin, who I learned about in advance, who has had this remarkable journey. Um, he was sentenced to death. Uh, you know, we can talk details if you want later, but he was sentenced to death for a crime that he did not commit. Uh, he was put in solitary confinement for 22 years. He's been there for, he's been in the prisons since he was 19 years old. It's just, he's 58, I think. And um, 
you know, talk about suffering and talk about injustice. Uh, so the connection there, uh, but the remarkable part of Jarvis's story was that it didn't end in these tragedies, um, uh, these injustices. Um, it, you know, he went a different way. Jarvis talks a lot about the people on death row or in prison for life who become bitter, who become angry in some cases, many cases become suicidal. Uh, some of them lose their minds, literally they go crazy. Uh, a lot of them become addicted. Uh, but Jarvis went a different way and it was with the help of some people he met early on, one of his criminal investigators, he was introduced to first to meditation and then to Buddhism. Uh, he was completely uninterested in either of those. He, they were completely sort of an anathema to who he was at that point. Um, when this meditator was, she was just worried about him because he, uh, he was just worried about him because he was not, um, okay, hold on. All right, it just, uh, it looks like, I guess Jarvis just tried a friend of his cause he wasn't able to get through, but he's gonna try again in a minute. I guess the problem, is, one of the problems in the prison system is that is related back to COVID is that there are many guards who've been sick and there have also been, uh, so there's a, there are fewer guards in the prison and a lot of the guards who are there are working double time overtime. And they, um, there have been protests in addition outside the prison. And so there are guards that are monitoring yeah. that, which means that there are fewer, fewer guards, fewer correctional officers on the tiers and the correctional officers are the ones who bring the phones to the inmates when they have permission to use the phones. So, you know, we're sort of caught up in the same, you know, web of, of uh, just being out of control, I guess, that Jarvis and so many other prisoners are involved in. You know, well, so um, everybody knows where the plan, which is being goofed a little bit by the phone availability at San Quentin, the plan was for David and I to talk till about eight o'clock and then Jarvis would call in and be with us and talk till about 8 30 and then open up for q a and you'll be able to ask questions that down at the bottom of your screen there's an ask a question button you'll be able to ask questions and then uh i'll moderate those questions but you can direct them to david or jarvis or uh or the older than dirt guy me uh you know well uh, how many times did you go out to san quentin i i, I mean like in the book it's like hundreds and hundreds of hours and of, of, days of conversations, which also David brings up the fact that you never quit, you know, the, and that, you know, we, we, you and I were talking about it earlier. It's like, um, that's, that's a big punchline in Pete Early's book that I, that I love so much who we had at town hall and, and it, it's something you, you two, you know, each other and you have in common, but through all the hell with Nick, you didn't quit for tech 10 years. You didn't quit. And, uh, that's, you know, that's something we try to do at the post prison education program is, is not quit, but can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, because there were so many obstacles and so many times when things didn't go as planned and so many heartbreaks and, um, uh, and you just kept, you just kept at it. You never, you never quit. The love, the love never stopped. Yeah. Well, I wanted to quit. There were a lot of times I wanted to quit, but, um, you know, I couldn't. Um, in fact, I, I think it must have been, it was about 10 years ago, maybe even a little bit more when the book Beautiful Boy came out, which was at a time when Nick had been in recovery for a couple of years. So the book had really chronicled 10 years before that. In fact, I was in, um, in Seattle at Town Hall around that time, um, not on Zoom, but in, in person, uh, which was wonderful because I got to meet so many great people there. But um, the anybody who's gone through the world of addiction, whether it's their own addiction, whether it's alcohol, whether it's to any other any drugs or whether it's someone that they love. One of the messages that we're told over and over again is that we have to let go. We have to stand back from them. We have to let them hit bottom if they're ever gonna get help or get well. And as a parent, or brother, sister, child, whoever you are, I mean, it is a complete contradiction to everything we're feeling. People would be telling me that when my son would be out on the street and he would be dying, uh, and they were telling me to let go of him. <laughs> and it's this sort of old-fashioned way of thinking about addiction that you that somehow people have to be isolated and vilified and made to 
feel so bad about themselves. But what I learned over time is two things. First of all, as a parent, I couldn't let go. They've told me over and over and over again, I couldn't do it and I never would have done it. And the other thing is it makes no sense because you've got somebody who's on the streets and somebody who's hurting and someone who's got pain in, in so many different ways and in dangerous situations and you don't want to shut the door on them. Um, and so, you know, no, I would never let go. And that's the other message I give because I hear from people all the time who are in the, they're sort of, they're in the throes of their own addiction or their a loved one's addiction and they are ready to give up. And I just say, hold on, because boy, if there's any examples of a story that shows that somebody who wasn't supposed to make it can make it. I mean, Nick wasn't supposed to make it till 21 and now he just turned uh, 38. All right, Jarvis is calling back now. Yay. Oh, it disconnected again. You know, while we're gonna, uh, can you, we would we do this after he gets on, or can you read the postscript out of your book on page 245, just by way of letting people know where he's at with his case right now? Yes, I will. Uh, or if you want to watch the phone and. No, no, I'll, 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 I'll do it right now. Um, yeah, so after, as I said, Jarvis has been there for 40 years. Uh, the story of his back story, uh, you know, I tell, which is that Jarvis had a very, very tough life. Excuse me. Hello. Hey Jarvis. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Jarvis. You there? Oh, Jarvis. As I said earlier, that sometimes the prison phone system, besides the lack of access to this phone, is that of course it's an old system and sometimes it sounds like we're talking through tin cans. Um, but a lot of times it's very clear. Uh, Jarvis, I don't know if you, can you hear me at all? I, I can't hear. Uh, Jarvis, I can't hear you if you can hear me. So uh, I, I'd be grateful if you just keep trying to call back. Super sorry. Um, anyway, so, so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to talk to him. It's so frustrating. And, you it's the same system we have up here. It's GTL. It's just horrible. But yeah. it, 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 what we finally did was we got back in the day, the Department of Corrections up here had a, an amazing guy as a secretary, uh, Eldon Vale, and we got Eldon to authorize a toll free line from the prison. So, male or female, you can even be in the hall. You can call our office uh, toll free from, from, from the prisons. And in that, doesn't it, and that bypasses GTL. So we accept collect calls from prisoners, but but if they know our toll free number, then it comes right in and it bypasses GTL. And I love it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Because they're a terrible company. I was going to say it's one of the many companies that exploit yeah. the people yeah. incarcerated. I mean, families that can barely afford, you know, their their rent or or food uh, in order to stay in touch with their loved one are charged exorbitant rates for these phone calls. So I'll read the uh, postscript. It really is um, a very, very, very short version of the story is that Jarvis was a, had a tough childhood. He was raised in poverty, addiction, violence, ended up in the, um, in the foster care system, then ended up in the juvenile justice system, which Jarvis describes as the youth on its way to prison system. Uh, he, after a, a year of crimes that included armed robberies, Jarvis was arrested convicted and sentenced to San Quentin. While he was there, there was a murder in the prison of a prison guard. And Jarvis was this young kid uh, who had no power at that time and did what he was told because if he hadn't done it, he would have been killed. And he was told that he had to, um, he could not defend himself against a charge of murder. And so he, Jarvis and two other men were charged and convicted of this murder. And Jar Jarvis um, you know, was given the death sentence and the, um, the death penalty, and that was, as I said, you know, that was 35 years ago. So he's been on death row that whole time. And the thing that's extraordinary about Jarvis's story is, uh, 
as again, it's so easy for someone like Jarvis to become bitter and to become angry and to go insane, to kill themselves, whatever it is. But Jarvis, um, he went a different way. Uh, I, I, he, um, he wrote many books, including some that have been taught in schools and prisons and juvenile justice systems, articles about spirituality and masculinity, and then he converted to Buddhism. Uh, the Tibetan Lama who taught him, proclaimed him a bodhisattva, one who works to end suffering in a place drowning in suffering. He developed a close friendship with the Buddhist nun Pema Chodron, who told me how much she admires Jarvis's ability to bear weight that would crush most people and the joy he exudes in a joyless place. She said his interpretations of Buddhist teachings inspire her and his insights helped her help her achieve a deeper understanding of Buddhist concepts she thought she knew. So the Jarvis' journey is remarkable. It's been going on now for several decades. And in the meantime, even as he's transformed, he's helped people in the prison, he's helped people outside the prison, um, he's also been involved in the appeals process, trying, of course, to prove his innocence. Uh, it is a draconian process uh, that takes not years, but decades for a person who's innocent to be able to even have his day in court. Uh, Jarvis has gone through hearings in the state of California. The appeals so far have not been successful, but now there's great hope because the appeals goes to the federal court. So um, uh, this is just the very, very, very end. The postscript to the book. To the book, uh, it starts off with a a, uh, a line from a song that had a big impact on Jarvis's life <laughs> uh, when his teacher, uh, this Lama from from uh, Tibet was telling Jarvis about all these Tibetan concepts and concepts about um, about meditation. Jarvis was completely uninterested and nor did he understand it. And he's told the, uh, he told this uh, Rinpoche that, and the teacher said, just do your practice and uh, your mind will follow. And Jarvis, what clicked into his mind is when he was growing up in Harbor City, he had an aunt who listened to the radio all the time. And her one of the, her favorite songs that he used to hear playing over and over again was a song by the Funkadelic, Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow. <laughs> Jarvis said when he heard that, he kind of understood this llama. And he said that it was, of course, fitting that one of the Funkadelics, George Clinton, was the one <laughs> allowed to understand the teachings of this great wise man. Anyway, so after that, uh, Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow. 2020 is the 30th year of Jarvis's arrival on death row. In August 2019, he had another setback when the California Supreme Court denied his habeas corpus petition. The appeal now moves on to the federal court. He, his attorneys, and his supporters continue to fight to prove his innocence. Meanwhile, Jarvis writes, meditates, celebrates his sangha, and does what he can to help other, others in prison, whether or not their prison has bars. Um, and that really is you know, Jarvis's story. I, I was suspicious of that, those claims. I heard about it before I visited him. I was, I was you know, was he really innocent? People told me that he was, but uh, I didn't know. And then was he really this extraordinary person that was described to me over and over again? And so before I went forward and decided to commit to writing about him, uh, I investigated. And first I investigated his case. And it is... Uh, an appalling travesty of justice. I mean, there are, Jarvis, if Jarvis was not poor and black, uh, he would not be on death row. Uh, he never had, growing up, he never had the support. And then when he got in the criminal justice system, he never had representation. Uh, and then when he was on death row, um, it's he was treated, you know, like scum, like an animal in solitary confinement for 21 years. Uh, and, and sort of by all rights, um, he would be like many of the people are who are there, who I met when I did visit, visit Jarvis. Um, again, angry, bitter, uh, incredibly violent, of course. Uh, but I investigated, I had conversations with Pema Chodron, his, his Buddhist teacher. A lot of his friends, he has a whole Buddhist uh, Sangha, a group of friends yeah. who, who uh, visit him and are devoted to him. And they're devoted to him as fellow practitioners but also devoted to his case and, and committed to getting him exonerated. Uh, and they told me story after story about him that was really, truly remarkable. They were the kinds of stories that are so remarkable that it was hard for me to believe that a man in death row could do things like save the lives of other prisoners, change the lives of guards, 
So even then I was still uh, uncertain. Uh, and so I did more research and I ended up contacting prisoners and I ended up uh, doing some interviews with guards and the stories were true and Jarvis's story is remarkable and that's why I went back to write it. And this was five years ago. Uh, I spoke to my editor, uh, Eamon Dolan, who worked with Forever. He was the beautiful boy editor and uh, he committed to this. He was very excited about this as a story about this remarkable person, about criminal justice, the story of forgiveness. Um, and Eamon and I talked about it and Jarvis asked me how long it was going to take. And I said, I can finish it in a year and a half. Uh, when I told Jarvis that he said, um, let's make a bet. Um, <laughs> that was five years ago. And yeah. like you said, there have been hundreds of visits to San Quentin to death row. Uh, sometimes I would show up at death row and Jarvis would be in the prison would be locked down. So I would have to leave and I wouldn't be able to see him sometimes for weeks, sometimes for months. Uh, when he had access to a phone, we could talk on the phone. Sometimes he didn't have access to the phone. So some of that five years was spent just trying to you know, do the job, to do the reporting. But also the story, I guess everybody's story turns out to be a lot more complicated. And you know, it's, it's, there's no summing it. And Jarvis's story is um, as complicated, as moving, as profound. And ultimately, it became for me a story that was answering a question that I've actually always struggled with in my life, you know, unrelated to this, related to my my son when he became addicted, related to my other kids, my family, to my people I know, my friends. And that is a question I think many of us ask, you know, can people change? And this is what the exploration into Jarvis's story was about. It was to learn if and somebody can change and how. Hello? This is Global Telling. I have a call from an inmate at the California State Prison, San Quentin, San Quentin, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Hey, Jarvis. Hey, Harry, Crystal. Oh, God, okay. Could can, can hear you now. It's not great, but it's a lot better than it was before we couldn't hear you at all. And you okay. can, yeah, I can hear you pretty good. I can hear you. All right. Hey, Ari, can you hear Jarvis? Uh, Jarvis, hello. We hear you fine, and we're looking at a picture of you. We've got a photo of you up on, on the screen. So, Jarvis, Ari. this is Ari, uh, and Ari's with the Post-Prison Education Program, and we're here with the Seattle uh, Town Hall and Elliott Bay Books, and we've got a lot of people who are visiting to tune in and listen and to hear your story and to meet you. Uh, so we're in Ari's hands, and um, uh, I, I'm going to let Ari take over from here. But anyway, Jarvis, I'm so glad you're here and you can meet, be with us. Yeah, uh, what we're going to try to do, Jarvis, if you can, I know you're going to have to call back in every 15 minutes, but what we're going to try to do is, is have you talk about your life and your story in, in whatever ways you want until about 8.30, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A, and David and I will be able to see questions from the audience on, on our computer screens, and then we'll just, we can direct the questions to, to you or to David or both of you or whatever. So um, you want to, we, we just read the postscript from David's book. David just read the postscript from David's book um, that kind of, updated where you are now legally with, with your case. And uh, after more than three decades, you want to just, instead of me asking you questions, do you want to just talk about, you know, just talk from your heart and say anything you want to say and, 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 and we'll, we'll be quiet while you go. No, no, it, it, it's, it's easier for me to just be, you know, to uh, engage in a conversation. Okay. Uh, everyone knows pretty much, you know, if you read David's book and read my book, you know, my, my life's out there and a lot of people's reading it. And, uh, I am, you know, currently uh, dealing with this uh, coronavirus that's quite and the way it's affecting the population particularly uh, death row, and I, um, we're, we're trying to work with it, we're trying to deal with it, and we're trying to stay safe. Um, the alarms have not been what they have been. We were hearing alarms all night, you know, people being taken out to emergency hospital. And there tragically has been a lot of people dying from this virus. So, um, that said, 
I I am very, very confident in my attorneys and what they're doing. And um, I'm just trying to survive it so that, you know, um, I have a chance to win my freedom. But pretty much, that's pretty much it. You know, everyone knows, I think everyone should know about my case and why I'm on death row and how that all came about. Um, and at this point, you know, spending a lot of time with David and David writing this book about my life. Uh, it's been, you know, it's been a good ride with him. I mean, I appreciate him so much. You know, a lot of times people ask me, you know, why is it that you, you know, you trust him? You know, and um, I did because, you know, um, well, initially, I, you know, I had, you know, I had my own reservations, but, um, but then I got to know David, and I just, you know, felt like, you know, here's someone that I can entrust my life and, and understand, you know, my voice. And he surely did in this book, and I just hope a lot of people will be able to read it. You know, I've read it three or four times, but the first two times I just wanted to find something to get wrong with it. Um, <laughs> because I just, I was so I was so, I was so embarrassed by it. Uh, but at, at some point, you know, I started seeing the man here that he did it right. And uh, I have to live with these troops, you know. And um, sometimes I didn't give as strong as a voice to him because I didn't know what, you know, what I thought was important for people to understand. But I think David has his, uh, he knows what, was going to be an interesting book, and I think he stayed with that. So that's basically it. You know, the yeah. book, I um, spent five years in prison. I can't imagine spending 30 or more years starting at 19. It's, it's extraordinary. I, in, in the book, there's so many triggers for me, and, and the one that I hit my hit – everybody in my office was – on page 63, it says, after that, Jarvis was placed in nine foster homes and three boys' homes, including some of which he was starved, beaten, and kept in squalor. At 13, he was moved from foster care system into the Division of Juvenile Justice. And, you know, when I read that, I just, it reminded me of a young man that we're, that our nonprofit is working with who's in one of the prisons north of Seattle. And I'm going to, with his permission, put his name out there. It's Derek Armstead, Martin Armstead. And I heard, about eight years ago, he was speaking to the Black Prisoners Caucus um, in, in the Washington State Reformatory Chapel and spoke extemporaneously about his life. And, and, it, and he talked in terms of uh, just, just what Dave, uh, David wrote about you on page sixty-three. You know, and and it to the point. And I just was blown away by what Derek said that day because it just seemed to me to be every every man's story, every woman's story, every prisoner's story. It's like drugs and addiction at an early age. Telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Yeah, and you know, for me, for me, um, you know, I think you know, maybe. 20 years or so, uh, is the fact that, you know, there's always someone's story worse than mine. And uh, I know a lot of, well, I know, uh, uh, yeah, I know a lot of people whose stories are a lot worse than mine. And, and, you know, every time I come across someone who I know who have told me that his life was a lot worse than mine, and I can't imagine what he went through, what he went through, and, and that is a trip that you can't imagine from where my life comes from to say to this other person, I can't imagine what you did. Um, but every time I come across these, these guys, I, I just know how to say, you know what? I had a really, really good foster home at the very, very beginning. And what they did to me really made me not turn inward with a lot of dark stuff, you know? Um, they taught me what right from wrong was, you know, and on many, many levels. And that's the only thing that I really believe of my childhood that really um, said, you know, that was that, that I was um, I was special, you know. And uh, even the worst places I've been, people thought that, you know, um, my life stories are really, really. really 
factory story, you know, as a system, you know, with the system as it was then. So, yeah, I just want to make very, you know, I really, really want to stress the fact that there's a lot of people working in me, and um, sometimes they're not, it shouldn't be this way, but sometimes they motivate me, you know, they say, you know what, I can be like this, you know. And, you know, to give just one example of that is people who, um, go to the jury, you know. They start off being here in one person and then they just start deteriorating and everything falls off. Their senses, their eating habits, everything. You know, when I watch these people go through 15 or 20 years like this, and I look at me with the support and friends I have and my ability to um, have a voice and get that voice out there. You know, how can I be more blessed than my than this environment? You know? So um, it's a special it's a special let me look at people and I, I it just it humbles me, you know, to you know, to even be here talking to you and uh, the viewers and just know that, you know, that there's 500 people in this building right now. No one's joining us, you know. So I really, really am grateful for Dave for giving me this opportunity and for you and for everyone to uh, read David's book. You know, I want to ask you a question. One of the, one of the, for people who didn't haven't read the book and and uh, aren't familiar with exactly what happened in the original sentencing hearing, uh, they might not fully understand that poem you wrote in 1992. But when I recipe for Pruno, when I read that, I was blown away, and I I and then I read it to somebody in my office, and she was blown away, and she read it. Um, to a prisoner who's out in, in one of the prisons here in town. His name is, or in the state, his name is Joe, Mil Joe Miller. And, and, and Taylor, who I work with, asked him if he had any questions to ask you. And this guy, who's, he, he's still locked up, and, and, but we're working on getting him out and into college. And he wanted me to ask this question, so I'm going to read it to you. It says, despite all the circumstances... What keeps you going on and wanting to write and put down poetry and reach out? The past can be a ball and chain. Despite the circumstances in moments of despair, what keeps you going even though you know the time in which you've been given, the sentence you've been given? Can you talk about that a little bit? And then maybe tell us a little bit about, about that poem because it's a really powerful poem. I may read some of it if, if we end up with time. Yeah. Well, you know, what keeps me going, I mean, what keeps me going is the fact that, um, you know, just me, you know, not just by being a Buddhist practitioner, but for someone who has found within the context of being a Buddhist that, you know, um, I can do a lot to help people. That I, you know, I can, you know, do things for people that would do back for me. Um, and, you know, it started off really, really tough, man. This is not no easy business here, you know. Uh, and I did, it was a learning process, you know. When you start caring about you, you start caring about the people around you. And if you know they're listening to you, then you want to be that voice for people to uh, do better by them. And, you know, in the process of doing all this, I heard so much about, you know, uh, what I'm doing. And, what my life gives value to. So to the guy uh, who's still doing time, I would just say to him right off the top, you know, that we can look around and, you know, we're doing better than most people, so we can just gotta keep doing as best we can. Uh, and then the last thing is this, and I think this is really important, is the fact that, you know, your life is, you know, in one way your life is promised to you, but it's also, promise to your family too, you know. Um, give me one second, excuse me. Sure. Sure. David, do you remember what page that uh, recipe for pruno? I found it. It's on page 75. I got it now. I wonder, uh, maybe you want to read a few lines until Jarvis gets Oh, here he is. Jarvis? Yeah. Hey, I'm back. 
come back. Uh, okay. One, the last thing I wanted, the, the last thing I wanted to say about that was um, that a lot of times when I get very, very experienced, it just seems real, real heavy on me. I I get a letter from somebody, or I, I know that you know my my life just don't belong to me. You know, it belongs to the many, many friends and supporters that I have who stood by me, and it is by their um, showing me on various, in various ways how I'm making a difference, that just, you know, propels me, it pushes me forward. Um, and again, I mean, I've seen people who couldn't go that far, you know, and Let's call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And I, I definitely, yeah, I know you're the guy you're telling me about. I know he will understand when I say that, you know, we, the last thing we can do is fall off that rock. Um, you have 60 seconds remaining. And I, and I think about that every day I get up, you know, to not fall off that rock. And uh, it shifts in so many directions that, you know, to find your balance every single day is, it's a, it's a task, you know, and uh, I've gotten pretty good at it, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard, it's very hard, and I'm not going to try to um, bullshit nobody and tell them that it's not hard, it is hard. But. That's probably David. He's probably got yeah. clicked off there. So yeah, every fifteen minutes the prison system uh, shuts shuts it off and disconnects him, and he'll call back in a few minutes. Uh, I don't know, Ari, if you wanted to take that as a moment to read a few lines from his. Yeah, I'll see if I can do it. So, so in the sentencing hearing, the judge was really harsh. It was uh, it was horrible, actually. And if you, if if you read David's book, it's just hard to read. Because the fact that Jarvis didn't make the knife, he didn't order the hit, he didn't commit the murder, and the, and the two guys who did that, the guy who ordered the the murder and the guy who did the murder, they didn't get the death sentence, and, and Jarvis did. And so it was pretty, you know, extraordinarily, you know, mind-boggling, I think, uh, for him to, to get the death sentence. And it, and it it and the language that the judge used was terrible. So in 1992, when Jarvis is only two years into the system, um, he had he wrote. He's calling in now. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to wait. We'll wait. Or maybe maybe you can read some of this while he's on the phone. In California. Let's call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Hey, welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> Ari was going to read a little of the poem since uh, while we were waiting for you, but uh, you didn't get that far. But uh, glad you're back. Yeah. Uh, Jarvis, if I read a little bit of, of, of Recipe for Pruno, then can you talk about it? I, what amazed me about this poem other than than what you wrote is that you're only two years into the system and it's just striking i mean i was thinking this guy's got like a 500 iq but so so for, for the for people in the audience who don't know pruno is like uh, you know when i was in federal prison there were all kind of concoctions for making really powerful alcoholic beverages and i remember one housing unit i was in they were they had it fermenting in the roof of a housing unit and it, it busted loose and fell down <laughs> the floor in the middle of everywhere but but that's an ongoing process and and, and so that's what Pruno is and then and, and what Jarvis did was was I, well, I'm just he alternated sentences so one line from the recipe for Pruno and the next line from the sentencing hearing so I, and I won't read it all uh, but it's Take peeled oranges. Jarvis Masters, it is the judgment and sentence of this court. One eight ounce bowl of fruit cocktail that the charge information was true. Squeeze the fruit into a small plastic bag and the jury having previously on said date and put the juice along with the mash inside found that the penalty shall be death. 
and it just goes and I'll, I'll skip down to the, the last uh, couple lines. Uh, after 72 hours, I've been, I have here on set my hand as judge of the superior court with a spoon skim off the mash. And I have caused the seal of this court to be affixed there too. pour the remaining portion into two 18 ounce cups. May God have mercy on your soul. It's just an extraordinary poem written in 1992. It, I don't know if that. It did not say, uh, it did not say glove, 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 right? <laughs> no, David didn't put that in the book. <laughs> that is, you know, you have to really understand what that meant. I mean, Gluck, Gluck, Gluck was like, oh, hell, you know? Uh, that just, uh, please get me drunk. Uh, because of, you know, you know, first let me just say this. A, a, a woman, a great friend of mine named Susan Moore, she showed me how to do that. You know, we were doing some writing experiment or I don't know how it happened but she she showed me how I can change up a little something, you know. Let's call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I figured that, you know, the worst is, you know, um the worst is, the worst is feeling I had was the fact that, you know, I got symptoms like that. And those words just run in my ears for for a long, long time. And um, I just thought, you know, let me see if you can really, really get your mind off this if you were to pretend like you're drinking while you're hearing this. And that's how that came about. You know, we're gonna we're gonna open up Q and A in six minutes at eight thirty. But but for, between now and then, can you talk about meditation that you did because it's such a big part of your life in in, in David's book? And uh, you know, does does the prison? How much? I mean, I know the answer to this, but does the prison give you space and time? Do people come in and teach you? And and, and which they do and. Tibetan tradition has lots of rituals and, 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 and how you engage with those. If you could, you could, uh, uh, talk about that and then we'll, and then we'll start taking questions online at, at, at eight 30. Well, you know, um, you know, I've always saw space in these cells where I can meditate if I ever thought I wanted to know how to meditate, so that's always been there. But I think um, meditation for me has always been about, you know, quieting my mind. In, in the very beginning, it was all about quieting my mind. It was all about trying to get my mind off a lot of stuff that was going on around me. It had no real depth in terms of Buddhism as a religion practice that you, you have. Uh, that came about, you know, slowly, but it did come about. Um, but normally, 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 uh, after I spent maybe seven or eight years really, really concentrating on my practice and doing that, um, at some point, I don't know what, at what point it was, I, I, I got so involved in helping other prisoners and doing all this uh, prison work that I was trying to figure out how to do that and so my practice started to, it, it became more about being on my feet you know and, and like you know more of an engaged Buddhist um, the academics of Buddhism has never been kind to me uh, but so a lot of the work I do a lot of the you know, I do for sure. I sit down and I meditate and I do my mantra and, you know, I do my frustration and I do all of, all of that. But my real joy is when I get up, you know, and sitting down is sort of like the feeling station for me. Um, I don't like sitting for long, you know. It's not something I really, you know, like doing. I used to, but I just don't do it no more. Um, but I just love communicating with people. You know, and that's where I just feel really, really safe at with my Buddhist practice. Uh, you know, I I was uh, the lady that runs our um, applicant and student services team. 
uh, wanted me to ask you for ad advice, and I'm just going to read Taylor's question. It says, what's your advice on, and, or what insights would, would you share with, with our students who are all either prisoners or former prisoners? And, you know, some have done two, three years, some have done 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, it's, a, it's a mix. But with our students who have stories a lot like yours, trauma, abuse, pain, learning to survive by self-protection and, and, you know, growing hard, you know, where should they start? Uh, and do you have any offerings that, that, that Taylor and her team can pass on to our, our students? I think um, one of the things I, I would definitely would like to pass on in that regard would be finding your voice. I think writing in prison is, is, a, powerful, is a powerful tool. And finding your voice is what allows you to hear the voices of other people. Um, learning how to hear that voice and trust that voice is very, very important. And how you learn to look and trust other people. So it's all about turning inward, you know, and trying to figure out, you know, where is my place? You know, where do I sit and feel comfortable with who I am? You know, how do I communicate with people? You know, I can't, and here's the thing, I can't even imagine, you know, how that, you know, how I would respond to something, you know, like, suddenly being out there, you know, a parole or release from prison, suddenly jumping out there and thinking, what are I supposed to think, you know? Um, so, yeah, I just think that, you know, it starts with finding your own voice, you know, and, and letting that voice continue to guide you in ways where you should not be afraid of going, you know? Uh, all those stories are stories that people want to hear about, you know, people, because everyone wants to save their kids from coming to places like this. Um, you know, and um, the more they hear stories like this, the more they can turn to their kid or turn to them or turn to their fathers or whoever, and, or their mothers and, you know, their sisters. And, you know, really, really, you know, humble themselves in the fact that they are, um, they, they know who they are in relationship to being paroled, being out there. Um, so, yeah, I really, really hope those guys in there, out there, uh, wherever we are, we continue to hear our voice and try to make a difference, you know. Um, yeah. Here's a, here's another question, and then, Meg, I'm going to pass your question on to, to David. But, um how does he see Buddhism intersecting with racial and social justice and with the active confronting of systemic oppression and harm? We got a question for me? Yep, it sure is. The, the next question after that's for David. You know what? I never, think, I never thought that could be a question for David. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, basically. Uh, that, that's not a question. I was just calling. Um, you know, um, I don't. I've never. I've never. I never thought that Buddhism in itself can really help um, change society. You know, I've always thought that you know every form of religious practice and faith has a, has a role to play in this. And one of the things for me that gets me all the time is how um, I can relate to Christians in prison or Christians out of prison or Muslims in other places in the world. I think, you know, uh, how, do we, how do we find our practice to, to uh, engage in what's going on with society is just based on the individual, I think. Um, I know for me, when I'm looking, you know, at my television, I see Black Lives Matter, and I see George Floyd, you know, um, and the whole history of, you know, um, um, violence and... Let's call Angela telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I, I, I sincerely try to um, not let my practice be taken over by that, you know. I just, you know, and that's a hard thing because there's a lot of emotional stuff there. But I really do not want my practice to be taken over by that. So it's a thin line in uh, wherever I can think that my practice.
elected to serve that social, economic, you know, racial stuff going on. Uh, I participate in that, but a lot of times I, I, I really, really consider my practice as some kind of uh, more of a sacred ground, sacred ground, ground type of thing. Uh, I just let who I am, you know, who I care about, what I care about be that other vehicle to be looking at, you know, how do we confront um, all the problems in America that we have with race and economic, uh, social status, and the rest. Uh, Jarvis, I've got a long question for you from a professor, but first, David, I've got a question for you, and it's why did David leave glub, glub, glub off the poem? Hey, uh, Jarvis, my copy of the the poem was first printed in, uh, again, you said it was 1992, and it won an award from Penn. It was a, uh, it's a remarkable poem, Ari, as you said, and as you read beautifully. Um, but my copy of it does not have glove, glove, glove. <laughs> I wish it did, and I would have put you know, it there. Well, you need to get a copy of that. Well, I, I, maybe, I can, maybe I've got some connections to somebody who can get me one of those. <laughs> By the way, yeah, one of the, let, me, let me try. Let me, yeah. well, let me just say that in regard to that. Uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of juvenile homes and detention centers for boys and girls and young men and some correctional facilities, they, they, they like finding freedom, but they wouldn't take the book because of the recipe for prison program, you know? Oh, my God, really? When I did, what, yeah, yeah, they just, they didn't want, they didn't want these kids, 14, 15 years uh. of age, going into their dormitories, you know, sliding uh. They're trying to make prison criminal. Um, I would hope they look at the sentencing, you know, but they, you know, it's a prison criminal thing. Uh, so what happened was they decided to make some issues. You have 60 seconds remaining. That were, you know, what the, the, uh, the juvenile system was asking for, you know. And, you know, when you let people do that, you know, it, it doesn't always come out the right way. Um, but they were just trying to protect a lot of these, uh, you know, they were really trying to give access to this book in places where they thought it would make a difference. And a lot of these places where they said, whoa, 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 you know, you, this is teaching people how to make wine, get drunk. Yeah. I, I was going to tell you, say Jarvis uh, so, that, uh, so you will find I, I interviewed a friend of Jarvis's, somebody who'd been in there for almost as long as Jarvis. And he did tell me that your Pruno was prized uh, in the year. <laughs> it, it, it was not just like all the Pruno. You did some, you had some special magic in your recipe. <laughs> oh, I, I, you know what? I, what? Oh, he's cut off again. Well, here. Uh, call you know, while we're waiting for him to come back on, because the next two questions are for, for, for him, David. But let's... Uh, let me, you know, you know what's amazing about both of your books and, and Jarvis's life to me is, you know, we had a, uh, I think it was 2006 and we had a, a, a funder, uh, actually it was a River Sticks Foundation, you know, basically said, if we don't put a human face on prisoners and former prisoners, then our nonprofit can't grow. If we don't, and our, our development director, Kayla Lombardi was talking the other day, we've got to show prisoners humanity. And that's what Jarvis has done from San Quentin in the worst damn circumstances imaginable. And what you've done in, 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 in both, you know, beautiful, beautiful boy and in the Buddhist. And, and you know, so it's, you know, he's back, right? Yeah. Good. Hey Jarvis. Hey, uh, glad you're back again. Uh, we were uh, Ari. I was just going to say, was talking about this idea of um, you know making an issue like you know when we talk about prisoners. Uh, we have this 
we it's easy for us to forget that every one of those prisoners is a human being but when we start to talk to a human being and that's the same we were talking about with somebody who is supposedly we, you know we, we toss people off as though they're all drug addicts but once you realize that every one of these people is a human being they have parents uh they are uh you know there's they're they had extraordinary lives in different ways and many times they've had really suffering lives but there's also joy it's really complicated um but uh Anyway, Jarvis, I'm, um, you said this earlier, and I'm going to let Ari you know, ask you the next question. But the one thing you said before is uh, he had something about trusting me uh, to tell your story. And I just want to say that, um, uh, you know, the, I, being trusted by you uh, to tell your story means everything to me. And it was an extraordinary time. I, I said earlier before you called in that it was supposed to take a year and a half. And you bet me that it wasn't going to be finished then. And <laughs> I owe you some big money when you get out of there. <laughs> In the meantime, um, but it's been no, five, it was, five years it was, later. It was only a pack. No, it was only a pack of Starburst. Oh, Starburst. Uh, okay, well that. Like, <laughs> I thought you was going to say Snickers. <laughs> All right. Well, this is this what it was. Yeah. Um, uh, I really appreciate that, David, and I'm so glad that um, you came about. You know, where you know. I was open enough to talk about my life, and uh, I couldn't have found, found a better person to talk to. So thank you again. I was going to say I'm, the worst part of the, I mean, COVID is just you know, devastating in so many different ways, but one of the really sad things that I miss so much is because of COVID, of course, the prison is locked down and there are no visits. Uh, and basically for five years, I've gotten to see Jarvis at least once a week or you know, at the most once every two weeks, sometimes two or three times the same week. And, um, you know, it's heaven to be sitting there together, uh, and I miss that. And so I, I'm looking forward to a time when, uh, you know, life can go back to normal, at least that much of normal, so that um, we can hang out again. Um, I'm going to... Have you ever described to uh, your views of uh, what kind of uh, concentric we have, we have uh, in the prison? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. I want to hear how you describe it. I mean, uh, I want to hear how you, how you, I want to, I want to hear how you saw that thing. I mean, because it was in front of you every, every, you know, every visit. So, what was your take on that? Because you know, I didn't know, I don't know the difference between, I do know the difference between that and others. But you come in the San Quentin, you sit down there, and they give you this, whatever it was, uh, cassette. Yeah. How did you, how did you see that? Well, about that. well, there are rules, as you can imagine, there are rules in prison. And one of the rules is that, no, you cannot bring in tape recorders. And I tried as a journalist coming in to get permission to bring in a tape recorder, and it was denied over and over again. Uh, so I either was looking forward to spending hundreds of hours with Jarvis and taking a lot of notes, uh, and I'm not great at that, and I'm not being able to read my own writing, uh, or doing what Jarvis suggested that I do, which is, he said, don't, in prison, one of the things you learn is that you don't stop asking. So I would go there every time for a visit, and I would. They, there was a, they do have a tape recorder back there that is reserved for lawyers who mm -hmm. have special permission or for psychiatrists. And so I would go in there and say, oh, can I get the tape recorder? And everybody would say, you know, where's the permission? But So one day somebody gave it to me. Oh, well, thanks. And so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Every time after that, for the next three or four years, I went in there, and because there was sort of this precedent, there was this assumption: oh, this guy gets the tape recorder. So it was uh, it was hard for me to find cassettes, blank cassettes, because that's it was an old, old-fashioned kind of tape recorder. There was nothing digital in there. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, and we were uh, we were able to uh, you know to record all those conversations, and there's hours and hours of conversations. There's a lot of laughter. There's a lot of crying. There's tears. There's um, you know, there's everything in between. A lot of storytelling. Jarvis, you know, is a great storyteller, as you can probably already tell. And, um, you know, and, and one of the hard things, the frustrating things about writing a book, uh, writing this book, um, is, is you know, it's uh, it could have gone on for volume after volume after volume. There's so much to tell there. And um, the, uh, you know, the stories are, this, and the stories, of course, continue. And that's why I'm so glad, Jarvis, that you're going to be, you know, continue writing and since uh, over the last, even during the COVID epidemic, um, Jarvid has published a story recently about the wish that he has and the logic for prisoners to be able to have access to cell phones, which of course are illegal. 
Um, but, you know, in the middle of this epidemic where families are cut off from each other and, and families, you know, when they would visit on a weekend, there'd be a long line of, of moms and dads and kids and coming to see their children and they can't do that now. And so at least it would be the humane thing to do to let them talk on the phone, to let them know that each other is okay. You know, what's happening up here is, is maybe you can get out of your cell for, you've got one hour to like get laundry, uh, wait for, you know, wait for the pay phone and, and, and you wait and you wait and you wait and you finally get to the pay phone so you can call your family and you got five minutes late left and back to your cell. And it's, it's just COVID-19 has just made things horrible up here. And, it, and it's about as bad as it can get. Jarvis, I want to ask you a question from a college professor who I happen to know, and it's kind of a long question. So I'll read it slow. He says, I'm struck by the times we're living in where the public slash free world seems to have more access to prison life such as David's access to you or the podcast ear hustle, the forthcoming film, the prison within, et cetera. I see this as shifting the narrative and putting the much needed human face on imprisonment and leading to some reform. You know, what more, what meaningful actions can we in the free world make for those inside? Um, um, I don't know, man. I mean, I really don't know. I, I, I can throw out some stuff out there, but, you know, to make, I think from the professor's point of view, how do we change the system? This call and or telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I mean, I think, I mean, just, just, just standing up and saying that this is not who we are. This is not, this is not how you treat human beings. And we're going to stay there and we're going to stand here and we're going to make sure that you know, our voices is heard as a society that you just cannot do this, you know? And, you know, sometimes that catch fire, sometimes it don't, sometimes it's seasonal, sometimes it isn't. But I think what we need to focus on is the necessity for that, those changes to be put in place. Also, I think a lot, I, you know what, I honestly think a lot of people who are, Educated around this, um, a lot of professors, you know, that who who understands what's going on with you know with the correctional system. I personally think that the best ones qualified are the ones who don't want the job. You know, oh. um, because they don't they understand what the job you know what the jobs dictate you know what the jobs going to dictate you know, and it's not them going up against Know, getting the inmates to change their advice. I think it's, it's getting the administration to give them access to us so we can make a difference in our own lives. Um, and as long as they deny you access, you know, the professor and other people who, you know, who can really, really create a language for what's going on in here, um, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. This next question, I want to, David and Jarvis, both of you answer it, please. And Jar David, you can see it, I guess. So it's Candace's question. So uh, y'all pick who goes first. But with your collective experiences with the criminal justice system, would you say that the prison system we currently have is obsolete? Should we be looking to bring dramatic reform or should we just abolish the current system? I know somebody, I know several somebody's in my office that are strict abolitionists, like militant abolitionists, but, but so should we be looking to bring that, bring dramatic reform or should we just abolish the current system? So both of you could answer that, please. Jarvis, I'll let you take it. The only thing I was going to say a minute ago was to add to what you said before, which is to reflect on something you've said in the past uh, about what can people do. Uh, first of all, there are some very specific things people can do in terms of supporting Jarvis in his case. Um, and if it's, if there's a page on his website, uh, uh, freejarvis.org, you know, how you can help. But the other thing that Jarvis talks about is, yes, there is a systemic problem. There is this, you know, this prison system is racist. It's, it's, it's violent. It's, uh, it's appalling. And it is not devoted to doing what we need to do, which is to help people get better, to help people heal, to help people who have addiction get treatment, to help people who have mental illness get treated. Um, but the other point is that, so there are these big issues, but there also is the reality that there are 
you know, up and up to about two million men in America who are in prison and uh, on death row alone, you know, where Jarvis is, there's about 710 uh, people on death row. And Jarvis talked about the fact that, you know, he has a friends, he has a support system. You know, we are all working for his exoneration every day. Um, but a lot of those guys have no one, they have no families. He said their lawyers don't even come to see them. And I know that, so beyond sort of the big question about dealing with the systemic problem, is just the idea of remembering that these are human beings out there. And Jarvis was saying that they people love to get letters, to be noticed, to feel seen. Uh, so Jarvis, I thought that was worth mentioning. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you feel counted. You know, I don't know if that makes sense, but you feel counted. When someone sends you a letter, you feel like you matter. You're, you're, you're being counted, you know? And, uh... I've seen people, I can't begin to tell you and your viewers how many people have that made a difference on the positive end of it and a difference on the negative end of it. Um, you know, yeah, to be seen as a human being is, is, I know a lot of us take that for granted, you know, it's like, okay, I mean, we're all human beings, what the problem is. Well, you know, when you're dehumanized to the point where you don't see yourself being a human being anymore, uh, that's, that's, that, that, that's not something that I don't think um, uh, no one should be able to feel, you know. Let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add, I'm going to add to the question about abolition. It's like this kind of a, so we, we've got a Facebook page that's got about 24,000 people on it. and. Uh, uh, we just put up uh, uh, a survey um, to uh, ask our supporters. Uh, it's, it was a survey written by our oh, development director. Monitored and recorded. And and when we put something up that's even remotely close to pro prisoner or empathic or or just it, it, we have to watch we have to watch the post like by the minute. I mean, somebody has to log into that post every couple minutes and, and, and get the hater comments off. Um, and I, you know, you and David and I mentioned showing the humanity of, of prisoners, for current and former prisoners, but I don't think that that will overcome the ignorance and hate in America. I really don't. But, uh, and, and I, I think we should get rid of the prison system. Um, uh, I'm right there with you. And I have to say that, um, you know, the, it is inherent. There's a guy that is in San Quentin who said a line that I opened the book with. And the line is hurt people, hurt people. Uh, that's what it's all about. And once we recognize that, once we recognize that every single person is, who is in our prison has been hurt in some ways, uh, and being hurt more and more and more every day while they're incarcerated, we are going to be going down into this spiral, uh, continue going into this spiral, because when we realize that someone is hurt, we can help them. And if we yeah. make people hurt less, we cause less violence, we, don't need the, we won't need these prisons. People who have mental illness should be treated by health professionals. People with addiction should be treated with health professionals. Uh, we do not want to lock up people. You have 60 seconds remaining. Um, are you Jarvis? Are you going to call back in as soon as the system knocks you back off? We've got uh, nine minutes to go. Yeah, whatever you guys want me to do. If, yeah. You know, you come snatch the phone. Yeah, if you can, if you, if, if you can, yeah, if you can call back in and and wrap it up with us, that'd be great. I want to talk a little bit about your website and 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 give ch people a chance to get involved with that. Um, okay, so let me uh, let me call you back. All right. Okay. You know, I just, David, I just got a, uh, we use WebEx, everything, WebEx teams, WebEx meetings, WebEx calling with the nonprofit. And so one of my coworkers, Layla Khan, just, uh, just, just sent a chat through that. I saw that says militant abolitionist exclamation, exclamation. <laughs> so that's kind of where we are. You know, you know, 
same thing as, you know, it's the same as defund the police. I mean, we have a system in place. You mentioned GTL, the prison phone system. Yeah. And, you know, think about the money. Think about, you know, it's the uh, Eric Schlosser, who's a friend of mine, who the guy who wrote Fast Food Nation is coming out with a book about the prison industrial complex. Good. Uh, it is about money. It's about making money. And therefore, if you've got a system that's about making money, uh, then the more people in prison, the more money these companies are going to make. And, um, you know, all the incentive is to lock people up and not to help people before they go to prison, when they're in the outside, help people with education, help people with nutrition, help people with health care. You know, that's the way out. You know, by the way, people, if you'll, if you, if everyone who's on, on this uh, crowd cast will look, Candace, who's the event manager for town hall has been posting some really cool stuff. She opened up the chat. And so if you take a minute to look at that, there's Jarvis's website. If you want to write him, the address is there. Uh, if you want to write to uh, prisoners who may not receive mail, there's an address for that. Uh, the unrepresented project is raising money to send men and women and so on. So look at, look at the uh, um, voices of San Quentin. So look at the chat over the far right side of your screen. Is, he, is Jarvis back? Yeah, one sec. Right. Hey, Jarvis. Thank you. For, yeah, thanks. You know, Jarvis, one of the things that just blew my mind and, and actually pissed me off, really, was uh, um, was the adjustment center. That you know, it I, I, in in the same paragraph in David's book, it's talking about being in a hole. Literally, is equivalent to torture, which it is. But but for you know, the prison system uses all these euphemisms. So, for example, they don't call prisoners prisoners; they call them inmates, or they call them offenders. Uh, but but the ab the adjustment center where you spent what twenty years. Uh, that's such a horrible almost, almost, almost 23. see that's that's a, to me what adjustments going on they lock you in a four by seven cell uh it, the, where's the adjustment remind me in washington state they call the whole intensive management units and i've been in those a lot and i've actually taught classes in them there's no intensive management going on. You're locked in this steel fortress that's formidable. You could drop a nuclear bomb on it. It wouldn't even ship it. There's no intensive management going on. It's just locking people up in single cells. And, 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 and they, they can't be expecting a positive income. They can't outcome. They can't. So like, I mean, we got, we've got, Five minutes, and and if you could talk, I mean, if you want to talk along the lines of, uh, like, maybe describe the the adjustment center. I think it would be really helpful, people, because people shouldn't be treated that way. Well, San Quentin's been around since the eighteen something. I, you know, I, I don't know how long it's been around, but the adjustment center been around since the nineteen fifties, if I'm correct. And um, it's just, you know, I don't know why they call it adjustment center. It, it, that's a faulty name, you know. Um, it doesn't even begin to adjust to anything, you know. Um, uh, they call it, most people call it F SHU units, security housing units. Um, you know, you, you can go in there, you know, when I went in there, the problem with me was the fact that I lived on the crime scene, you know. So everybody who uh, knew about the case, knew about the crime. I mean, I literally lived on the crime scene, so I was right there, you know. So everyone, you know, had an extreme amount of hatred for me without knowing the facts or anything, you know. So they put me as a punishment, you know, um, not just to, you know, hold me in there. Uh, it was terrible, man. I mean, it's, you know, when I, it's, yeah, you know, and, and I, I found my way out of there, you know. Um, but like you said, there's no way in the world that most people going in there is not positive. That's just oh. not going to happen, you know. Uh, but I can guarantee someone's going to keep their job for another 10 years and probably retire because that person's coming back. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a 
source of employment for a lot of for the system to, 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 to function. You know, and to take that system out of the equation, like, you know, I can't even, I don't even know how it's going to be. You know, in, in California, the CCPOA, the, the union is one of the strongest, most powerful unions. And whenever they want to build a prison, they build one. Uh, Jarvis, a, a chat message just popped up that's to you, and I want to read it to you, David, and I can see it. It says, it says thank you so much uh, for this beautiful conversation, Jarvis. Uh, the beauty of your soul is touching the world, dear brother. Uh, so that's that's a message to you. Uh, uh, and it's... Yeah, I'll just read it again. Thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. Um, and I, I, people, you can Google Free Jarvis or uh, the web has he's got a, an excellent website, freejarvis.org. org, uh, and uh, uh, you know, go to it and get involved, get on the list, serve. Uh, um, and, and, you know, from from me uh, on behalf of Post Prison Education Program, you're amazing, and uh, our heart goes out to you. And David, you also. Thank you so much. And Town Hall, Candace, thank you. Monitored and recorded. Listen, Ari, thank you. That was uh, that was amazing. And I, I know that Jarvis, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, and I thank everybody who. Supports me, who supports you know ending the death penalty, who supports getting rid of the prison system as it is. Um, I, I I I really appreciate that, and wherever that takes us in our life journey, I just hope we continue to make it. Do it. You know, here's um, this will be the last thing we can do because we're out of time. But here's a message that came in on on Town Hall's YouTube from Kevin. It says, "I feel you from a brother who did it on the payment plan." Hearing you enhances my gratitude of spiritual freedom. That also for you, Jarvis. Thank you so much. Oh, he, he was disconnected, but that was such a beautiful. Oh. And that's, uh, he'll, uh, hopefully he'll call me back and I'll pass that on. Okay. Ari, that was, um, yeah, we've had a lot of conversations like this, but this was really special. And, you know, bringing in your own experience and your own sensitivity to this. And I'm really grateful. And, um, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, and also thank, of course, the, you know, Town Hall and Elliott Bay Books. And you know, I miss it up there in Seattle. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Candace, you're going to end this now? How do we do yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Thank you both so much. Um, it's been a really powerful event. Um, thanks for being here and for presenting with us and for bringing in Jarvis. I think it was just so important for people to hear his voice. And so thank you for that. Um, thanks to everyone also for watching. Um, do check out the chat. I posted a lot of um, a lot of resources in there if you want to be in touch with other other people who are incarcerated as well as Jarvis. Um, there's a couple different options in there also for donating um, to supplies, um, having having to do with COVID as well. Uh, more information about that since um, that is probably not super forthcoming. Um, to people who are in prison. Um, if you are interested in uh, watching more town hall content, you can follow this crowd channel by clicking on the follow button in the top right corner. Um, we really encourage you to support Elliot Bay, who is a partner on this uh, program. You can click the buy the book button uh, on this page to go directly to their website to purchase a copy of David's book. Um, and uh, thank you again so much, Ari, and thanks, David. I think he's gone, but um, yeah. thank you so much, and um, have a peaceful evening. Yeah, good night. Thanks, everyone.